Thank you for having me here to discuss this paper. So let's start with what the paper does. The paper wants to look at this phenomenon where you have this market for a financial asset, a large trader comes in and needs to sell the asset. The fundamental value is known to all people, so we're going to work in an environment where we all know what the, what the well, there's a common value for the asset. We all know what that value is. We don't have to worry about information frictions with respect to value. This large trader comes in, wants to sell the asset. The large trader chooses a rate at which they're going to sell. They have a fixed time period they're going to be in the market for, and they're going to sell at a constant rate in this time period. Whom are they selling to? They're selling to market makers who are competing in Corno fashion. So the market makers are deciding what quantity they'll be buying at each time period. These market makers have costs to holding inventory, and these costs are convex in the, in, in the amount that we ask them to hold. These are the two main strategic players in, in the market. By the way, I would call this a sequential game rather than a Stackelberg game, minor quibble. In a conventional sense, I'm used to using the term Stackelberg for, uh, uh, for a case in which the first mover and the second mover are on the same side of the market. Here, they are on, they are on different sides of the market. Anyway, so at stage two, these um, market makers, that, well, at stage two, these market makers are buying from the large seller, but all of this is taking place in con 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 continuous time. Because of these convex inventory costs, these market makers can't hold on to, hold on to the stock for too long. So, so then the third ingredient in the model is you have these small traders, these SDs, who are coming in at some sort of Poisson rate, and the market makers also trading against them, and in the long term will offload the shares they buy from the large trader to the short traders. This is a complicated model. Albert presented a sketch. The model is complicated. If you st start working with dynamic market microstructure models, you write down the simplest model you can think of in your head, and before you know it, it's got so complicated that it's become impossible to solve. So hats off to the authors for the skill that they've shown in, in managing to solve this model. Now, uh, many of the propositions, by the way, relate to here's what the solution of the model is. Once we get through that, some of the results that uh, jumped out at me were the following. One is when the large trader uh, exists compared to the situation when the large trader does not exist, the bid ask spread goes up. The large trader prefers that the duration that they're trading for is known to the market maker. So that is, they prefer sunshine versus stealth. One result that Albert didn't mention, this is lemma six. We saw lemma five, but not uh, lemma six, is that even as n goes to infinity, remember these are Corno, com, com, uh, these market makers are competing in Corno fashion. Even as n goes to infinity in the limit, they can earn positive profits when the large trader is there. The short-term traders, the small traders, well, might benefit from the presence of the, uh, of the large trader, and the e e e equilibrium fails to be constrained first best. Now, there are three things I want to do the rest of the way. One is I want to talk about some of the in intuition behind the model. Then I want to reflect a little bit on how well the model applies to what's going on in the markets. Finally, if we have a couple of minutes, I want to think about the ex 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 existential question with respect to the paper. So let's start with a simple two-date model. You have time zero. At time zero, a market maker has an in inventory position I. Let's assume there's only one of them. Uh, we can, or maybe there are many of them, and they choose a, a quantity that they want to sell. Assume for now there's no large trader, some short-term trader shows up. In the paper, the short-term traders have linear demand curves for the asset. They have private values, and so they have linear demand curves. So they show up with a demand curve. They arrive to buy shares. The market maker incurs some in inventory costs the rest of the way, and you know, at date one, the model ends. So it's, a bit, it's effectively a single period model. Let's assume the marginal cost of holding the inventory depends on the, on the amount that we are, the, um, on, on the pre-existing uh, position that the market maker has. OK, we know how to solve a model like this, right? It's a Corno model. So we'll fix the quantities offered by all of the other market makers. The, the, small, the a small trader had some linear demand curve. We can think of this market maker as have our market maker J, if you wish as having a, a residual demand curve, and then they're trying to pick which point in this demand curve they want to be at, and that will determine what the price uh, in the market is. If I'm the market maker and my in, in inventory is high, 
well, if I don't manage to sell it at time zero, I'm stuck with, with these high costs towards the end, and so I'm keen to sell. So if you wish, I'm going to choose a point where the quantity I, I trade is large, thank you, and, and the price is small. If, my, if, my, if, if I have a negative in, in, in inventory, and now this trader comes in and wants me to sell even more, well, I'm not that keen to sell anymore. And so I choose a small quantity and the price is high. So increase inventory because of this fact that the marginal cost is going up in, in, in the amount I have means that if a short-term buyer shows up, they face a higher, uh, the, you know, I sell them a higher quantity, they get a better price. I didn't draw the supply curve, but we can do that in our heads. For the, uh, for the sh uh, small traders who want to sell, it's exactly the converse. If my, if my inventory as a market maker is higher, well, I sell them a lower quantity and I offer them a worse price. Okay, that was a simple two-date model. Of course, the model in the paper is much more complex than that. The cost of holding inventory depends on how long I have to hold it for. How long do I have to hold it for? It depends on the e equilibrium of the game. It depends on, the, on when these traders arrive, so depending on, on the path that the market takes and the path of arrival, all of this is uh, sto 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 stochastic. It depends on our future strategies. Some of the intuition, I think, can be captured by think of the expected inventory cost the market maker faces when they're being asked to trade, which consists of two components. It consists of, well, what is the size of their in inventory right now? And the second component is how long will they expect to hold, hold the shares that they're, that they're buying right now? The long term, the gains to trade are all amongst the traders. Some people have a private value plus omega, so they're the ones who want to buy. Some people have a private value minus omega, they're the ones to sell. They're not allowed to trade with each other. All trade in this model is happening through the market makers. In the short term, the gains to trade between the market makers and other traders, the market makers have a private value of zero. Because of these inventory costs, if we ask the market makers to hold the, this inventory for too long, we exhaust gains, gains to trade between the traders and the market makers. The bid-ask spread increases with, uh, when the large trader comes in. There's some sort of non-linear effect in the marginal cost of holding in inventory, the ma marginal cost of buying a share versus selling a share. And I didn't quite get the intuition for that of the model. My conjecture, my best guess, is related to the length of time that we asked uh, the market maker to hold this position for. Let's extend this Cordon intuition just a little bit now to the idea where there's a small trader and there's a large trader who comes in as well. Seems to me, you know, so the, the large trader and the market makers are trading every instant. So they're in the, uh, the market on a con con continuous basis. The small traders are arriving at some sort of form, 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 form rate. So they show up every now and then. So it seems to me if you look at any time in, in interval, there are three relevant events or three relevant states that the market could be in. One is there's only short-term traders in the market uh, because the long-term trader's done. The second is both the long-term trader uh, and so both the large trader and the, and the small trader in the market. And the third is there's only the, the large trader in the market because it just so happened the short-term traders didn't show up in that, in that time span. When I look through the equilibrium quantities they have, they seem to depend on state one and state two there. I missed whether they depended on state three or not. I'm quite happy to concede that might be on me. Maybe I just missed it somewhere. But then I started thinking, okay, let me think. I have a hard time thinking about continuous time models and so on. Let me try and write down the discrete time and, and analog and think about what's going on. In discrete time, the aggregate demand curve at each point of time in the market is going to look, at, will look like one of these three. There's only short-term traders in the market, the long-term trader is trading a constant quantity F, so we shift the demand curve out F. Or there's no short-term trader in the market. The short-term traders fail to arrive at that point of time. There's only a long-term trader, in which case they're trading a fixed quantity F. Well, here's where I run into trouble. I run into trouble in two ways. One is it seems like the market maker should want to condition prices and quantities on all three demand states by the way. In other words, it seems like the market maker would want to set prices based on the aggregate order flow, which of course is the conventional way we think of market microstructure and prices in market microstructure. But somehow that's not quite well what's going on. The other is, 
how is the price in this market determined if the short-term trader didn't show up while the long-term trader is trading a constant quantity? I've hit a wall here because I don't know how to think about or no competition when your demand curve is vertical. Maybe it's some price competition that's needed. So, so indeed, so this is something that certainly the authors could try and e explain a um, little bit better. How well does the model apply? In practice, of course, high, high frequency traders set both prices and quantities as we have a limit order book and I'm choosing what quantity I want to offer at what price. Thank you. And so we think the equilibria are really in supply demand functions, okay. The model is complicated. <laughs> I'm, Albert, I'm not going to ask you in a co-authors, oh, you need to go solve a model with uh, supply demand function. No, that's not it. I do want to think about how well the model applies here. So think of Kyle, Klemperer, and Maya 1989. Klemperer and Maya tell us that when marginal costs are steep, the equilibria kind of look like core, lies in the Korla model. When marginal costs are, are flat, they look like a, as if they're in the Bertrand model. In, in this model, marginal costs are steep when the inventory is high, flat when the inventory is low, which seems to say, well, maybe there's some, some not, it's not exactly regime shifting, but maybe sometimes it'll, they look like the Cornell model and sometimes like the Bertrand model. The trading strategy of the, of the large trader here is restricted to, we have a fixed duration, we have to trade at a flat rate. Literally, this is, you know, it was hard to solve this model and I'm extremely sympathetic to the idea that, you know, as in many of my own papers, when I start writing the paper, I think I'm climbing Mount Everest and when I'm done writing it, it looks like I'm crawling on the ground. So I'm sympathetic to the idea you want more complicated stuff, but it seems that in this case, the large trader should want to condition on prices and inventory changes that occur when some of these uh, small traders show up. Potentially, the large trader could arrive in stochastic um, um, fashion. There's, you know, sometimes the market makers have to guess whether a large trader is there. You have these iceberg orders. The market makers trying to guess whether the large trader is there or not. Be, uh, you know, in which case things get more complicated. One comment on the welfare results. So this model, uh, you know, I take the point that many times the large trader is trading not for information reasons. That's what's going on in this model. When we start thinking about welfare and what a regulator can or cannot do, it is important to remember that one of the big roles of a market is to engage in price discovery. Sometimes in finance, we think, oh, it would be great if we had this flat demand curve, frictionless markets, we can all trade on that. You know, when we think about incentives, frictionless markets are not necessarily the best thing. This large trader might be the person we rely on as a block holder to monitor the manager. We might rely on them to acquire information about the firm. Giving them an incentive, making it costly, a little bit costly for them to exit might not be so, such a bad thing. I want to say a, one more, a couple of words in the positive profit e e e equilibria. So let's suppose the market makers start with zero initial in, in inventory. As n goes to in, in, if, infinity, they earn positive profits in this model when the large trader is present. So I found that to be quite a striking result. And I started thinking through, okay, what are similar results that we know of? You know, why don't they compete more aggressively and compete profits away to zero? So one thing that comes up, okay, this is a dynamic game. Maybe it's one of these repeated game things, you know? Well, it's not exactly that. You don't have these punishment strategies where you catch deviators and you name and shame them. And you know, if uh, one of you deviates, then we all play, play the strategy that holds you down to your min-max payoff for some period of time. We don't have any of those complex strategies going on here. So it's not clear that that's it. Is it non-exclusive uh, competition? You know, in some models of non-exclusive competition, including some of my own work, you can get positive profits as n, n gets large. Not exactly that either, because the literature there relies on information frictions. Inventory costs are a friction. It wasn't clear to me the mapping was uh, exact. One paper I want to mention here is a paper by Cordella and Dutta, 2002. They look at the general equilibrium model of a production and consumption e uh, production economy where agents consume as well. And they say that, you know, the dynamics really matter. And as N gets large, Corno equilibria fail to converge to well world race in e e e equilibria because at time T, when somebody takes an action, they were taking into account the impact this will have in the long term. And it turns out that, you know, uh, potentially you can get something like uh, positive profits out in that model. 
uh, the welfare results uh, very quickly. Uh, so the, uh, the, think of what's happening with the short-term traders, uh, uh, with the small traders, sorry. I have ST there and I keep mixing in my head whether it's small or short-term, it's actually small, thank you. So the welfare results, when the large trader shows up, uh, small buyers are better off because prices are lower. Small sellers are worse off because they're facing worse prices. So you can think, well, there's some sort of trade-off here. On average, they might be better off or worse off. And the result in the paper is depending on the trading intensity chosen by the large trader. Small traders might be better off or worse off. One issue there is that the trading intensity itself, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a choice variable in the model. Uh, another finding is that the regulator can ask bid and, f uh, bid and ask prices that yield a higher level of welfare. Now, if it's the case that we're thinking about sort of finite end in the Kotler model, well, this is well, this we know, right? So that way, with uh, finite end, we don't realize first best. One thing I was curious about is, w does the model, uh, 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 does the regulator problem, the, the, does it achieve the constraint? Uh, sorry, does the constraint first best in the regulated problem achieve zero profit as n, n, n gets large? And that's uh, something to explore. Finally, I think the author, I, I mean, I struggled with this a bit, and I think this is where the authors could help the reader a uh, little bit is tell us what we should do with this model. So if I'm not a, la if I'm not a large uh, investor or not a market maker, as an ac ac academic, what, what should I take away from this model? And I started thinking models can be useful for a few different things. Maybe they're building blocks for other people to build on. With complicated models, it's more d d difficult. Maybe they solve an outstanding puzzle. That's not quite the case here. So then you think, well, what is the phenomenon that's told us about that we really want to know about? L last line here, Chester. And, and, the one thing, and, and the one thing, the, the case I will make is high frequency traders are the market makers in, a, in, in, in many stock markets now. We do worry that because they're so high frequency, they're using this complicated software to trade. That's a black box and we don't know what's in the software. And we worry what adverse market events that might happen that humans cannot figure out. And I think this is the case I would make for the paper is that they're opening the black box a little bit and telling us something about what these market makers and high frequency traders would do. And I think the authors could sort of help the reader a little bit by making, making, making that case too. Thank you.